continue studying this week about the treasure that's on the inside of us. Our foundation verse for quite a while has been 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And when Paul wrote that to the Corinthian church, in the context, he is really talking about the gospel message. But the way the Holy Spirit's been having me focus on it here recently, he's been combining it with Mark chapter 4, where the sower sows the word, and of course, <laughs> he sows it into soil. Well, we're the soil, without doubt. And the word in this, uh, in this study is Christ in us. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. When you got born again, God sowed the Word, all right, you're the ground. <laughs> God sowed Christ into you. The mystery of the gospel, Paul says, is Christ in you, our hope of glory. So we have this treasure, not only the gospel message, but the treasure of Christ Christ in us through the this gospel message through the through the gospel we have been born again with the very life of Christ you know gee last week we looked at fruit some and and uh, Jesus plainly says without me you can do nothing but see the wonderful part about the gospel is if you're a believer we're not without him <laughs> he is the vine we are the branches and as long as we stay connected with him, well, how do you do that? Well, just don't go running after other gods and and uh, uh, living like the world. And I mean, just stay connected. You know how to stay connected to the vine. Stay close to him. Well, a branch doesn't have to have... Does a branch work to have the life flowing through it? No, it just needs to stay connected to the vine. <laughs> I'm talking about a... Of course, uh, uh, the illustration there would be like a grapevine or the little branch. Its only job just make just stay connected <laughs> because the life will flow. And that's what we've got to understand. So got a, he's got a particular point to make today. I hope you've been listening to these messages because uh, I'm not going to have time to do a whole lot of review. Of course, being a teacher, I have to do a little bit. I just have to. So let's do that real quick. And then I want to. I want to bring us on into where he's going to take us today. So we've all heard a hundred messages or more on the sower sows the word. And we all started off probably understanding how, I mean, you can't even get saved without hearing the word of God. Somebody either had to read it, had to hear it, had to hear it live, hear it preached on the radio, on a CD or something, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, recently I was teaching in another place and, and you know, if, when you just boil it down to its simplest form, what is, what is faith? Well, faith believes what God said. What if Adam would have believed what God said? You know, the, the tempter came and convinced Eve to eat the fruit of the forbidden tree and then she turns around and offers it to, to Adam. And Adam, I'm not teaching on that today, but Adam made a conscious choice because God had said that in the, in the day you eat thereof, you'll surely die. But he's watching Eve eat it. I mean, it says he was standing right there with her and he watched her eat it. And there she is still standing there just as beautiful as ever. And she didn't, by all of his senses telling him, uh-oh, she didn't, she didn't. God said we would die. The devil said we would not surely die. My senses are telling me she didn't die. Somebody here is lying, and he made a conscious choice to not believe the word of God. Of course, he couldn't see that she spiritually died. She did die, and he died too. He died spiritually the same day, just like God said. So what if Adam would have chosen to believe God's word in spite of of every contra in spite of everything that his five physical senses told him and what the devil told him what and what his wife told him <laughs> other people I'm just saying what if he said no I know what God said see Romans chapter 8 says if you leave after the flesh you'll surely die 
Well, that can't be talking to unbelievers. They're already spiritually dead. Who's he talking? I mean, we and we all physically die if the Lord delays his return, so he's not talking about physical death. He's talking about spiritual death. If you habitually live after the flesh, you will die. That's really not any different than his what he said back there in the garden. If you eat the fruit of that tree, you'll you'll die. And still yet today, the devil's saying, no, you won't. You know, there's uh, many messages, uh, ultimate grace is rad radical grace. They say, oh, no, you can live any way you want to. It doesn't matter. You, you can live after the flesh and you won't die. Well, that's the, the, the serpent hasn't changed either. He's still saying his same message that he said to Eve back in the garden. Our job is to believe God's word. So if Adam would have just held on and just believed what God said and said, no, I am not eating the fruit of that tree, where, where would we be? We'd be in the garden. <laughs> Thank you. We'd be, hallelujah, you know. Faith believes what God says. It's just, it's just no more complicated than, than that, really. Faith believes what God says. Well, that's why faith c comes by hearing the word of God. You can't have, how do we know there's a heaven? The, the Bible tells you there is. It's not because I've ever seen it. I've never seen heaven with my eyes, but I know there's a heaven because the Bible says there is. How do I know there's a hell? The Bible says there is. How do I know what sin is? That's a good one. <laughs> a lot of people think, well, if it feels good, it can't be sin. Oh, come on. <laughs> it says even Moses, you know, he, he you know, yeah, listen, you don't want to endure, you don't want to enjoy the pleasures of sin, not even for a season. I like how Pastor Brock says, he says, when he dies and goes to heaven, now he knows he won't have his flesh there, but he says, even after I die and go to heaven, I'm gonna, it's going to be 30 minutes before I'll believe my flesh is dead. I just won't believe it. <laughs> and you can't listen to the flesh. It'll lead you away from faith. Well, all right, getting back to today's message. In the very beginning... Most of us were hearing things that we'd never heard before. Like, not only can you be saved, you can be healed. And he wants to heal all the time. Well, I had certainly never grown up with that message. But that's really what the Word of God says. And it's taken a long time for me to, that, for the Word to be sown into me to the point that a lot of thorns and rocks of unbelief and false doctrine and, and what, fit, what my five physical senses have seen to have that stuff rooted out of me where I could become better soil so that the word could produce more fruit. And how about healing fruit? I like healing fruit. See, but now I'm believing not only to have healing fruit in my own body, I want to have be able to pray for you and have healing fruit in your body. And that's what the Lord wants too. And that's really what today's message is about. Well, I'm going too long again on, the, on that subject as always. But we all started out with the sower sowing the word Basically, how we could receive from what God has provided by sowing his word into us until a harvest comes and prosperity fruit. Most of you know, he had me back in the early days. He had me walk the floor and speak several verses out loud. He had me do it for four hours a day. Why? Because I had really stony ground. <laughs> I had been really severely taught from the time I was a little boy that if you had God, you couldn't have anything. You know, you had to be poor. They used to have a, they'd make a joke, you know, like it's funny, but they meant it. And, you know, talking about their pastor, you know, they say, God, you keep him humble, we'll keep him poor. And they were only half kidding about that. <laughs> they pretty much believed that. But God's not really that way. God's a provider. He's, a, he's the ultimate father. Well, fathers provide. That's what they do. I mean... You know, and, and, well, and mothers too. I mean, mothers are nurturing and providing everything that their children need. Fathers, you know. I just saw a statistic, a headline yesterday, I think it was. And for the first time in American history this year, uh, more children were born out of wedlock than in wedlock. Oh, my God. What, what a war the devil has launched against the family. Not only in this country, but around the world. But in this country, even trying to destroy the basic foundation, like are you a man or are you a woman? I mean, I've never seen in my 75 years such an onslaught against the family. And the family, and, and it, it, it's real easy to understand why, the family, just like these bricks behind me, the, the family 
is the foundation of civilization. If you want to crumble a civilization, destroy the family unit. And that's exactly what's going on in this country. And, in, and that's not the message today either. I, I don't know. I'm trying not to ramble, but it seems to be rambling day. I don't know. So we all started off sowing the word into us to believe many of the provisions. You know, I, gosh, I remember. Thank God for Pastor Dave sowing and sowing and sowing the born again trail into us to where I finally got it that we're, you know, we, we don't have to sin anymore. You know, you really don't. We've been made free from sin, boy. Because I was taught from the time I was little, you're just, you're just an old sinner saved by grace. I mean, thank God. They would preach Christ and Him crucified, and they loved God, and I know they're born again, but they just didn't understand what happened. And basically, they believed that we were, we were forgiven by the sacrifice of Christ, but we weren't changed. Otherwise, how could you say you're still just an old sinner saved by grace? That, see, and that's not what the Bible teaches. And thank God for Pastor Dave, who lovingly but relentlessly just kept taking us down the born-again trail, kept teaching us the truth, kept taking us back to Romans 6, Romans 7, Romans 8, over and over and over again, and encouraging us to pray in the Spirit so that the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, could lead us and guide us into the truth. And finally, oh, finally, I understood. I really don't have to sin anymore. Romans 6, I... How can I, who've been made free from sin, continue in it any longer? <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> no, I don't have to. And, you know, Dave's wonderful series. If you haven't heard them, I really recommend it. Every single series that Pastor Dave has at his website, if you haven't heard all of those, oh, my goodness, it's manna from heaven. It's fresh manna. It's wonderful. You need, you need every single one of them. I, I still sometimes I just had to have a Dave Fest. You know what a Dave Fest is? I just I'll just pick one of those wonderful series and and uh, man I'll just I'll have to uh, devour several of them. You know and it, oh it's always refreshing. It's always faith building. It's always encouraging, and uh, it, it'll build you up. And then plus if you do what's on them like praying in tongues and fasting and those things, that's where you really start building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keeping yourselves in the love of God. Hallelujah. Am I still rambling? I think so a little bit. <laughs> but I'm kind of leading up to it. We all started there. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Or you could say God sows his word into you in every area. Salvation, healing, prosperity, um, mental uh, So you'd be set free from mental torments and things if you're one of those kind of people. Whatever it is you need, see, God, there is no problem that man has that God hasn't provided the answer to, and all the answers are in his word. So we all start there, sowing the word of God into us so we can live by it. That's how faith comes, is to know what God said and then believe what God said. Okay, but where he's uh, really, <laughs> what, what he's doing now in these end times and getting us really ready for revival is getting us to understand that there's a much deeper level to the sower sows the word. And that's when you got born again. God sowed the very spirit of his son, the life of Christ, it's called in Romans 8. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. You were born of this last Adam. Just the same way you were the first time you were born from your mother's. You were the life of the death life <laughs> that came in you, you were of the first Adam. And you were a sinner by nature because you were born of the first Adam. When you get born, you, see, in Christ, when you believe in Christ, you die in him. You, you die, really, to that first Adam. And you're resurrected to new life in Christ. That's why he is called the last Adam. He is literally started a new species of people. He's not starting like from scratch, like, okay, I'm going to wipe out that first, all the descendants of the first Adam, I'm just going to wipe them out and start over. No, from that dead species, God is quickening each one who will believe to new life. You literally are born again. 
Christ becomes your Adam because you are a new creature. You'd, that you now, that born-again believer you, did not exist before. New creature. You're, you're a part of a new species. You're, you're a child of Almighty God. You have been born of the Spirit. I mean, the Bible says it so many wonderful different ways to get us to understand we are not the same old sinner just forgiven now. No, we were an old sinner. We died in Christ. We were resurrected as a new person in Christ. And now we're the children of God. We, are, we were sinners. The Bible says now we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Glory to God, my feet are wanting to take off. I'm telling you, that is good stuff. If you can't get excited about the gospel, I don't know what you can get excited about. But now he's trying to grow us up even uh, beyond that to where not only do we understand that we've been made free from sin, we are the righteousness of God. He will provide for us no matter what's going on around us. We can hear his voice. We're led by his spirit. So many things. I just thank God again and again for Pastor Dave Roberson who laid the foundation, at least in our lives, of all of these truths. And, and I, I, but now the Holy Spirit is bringing us into this end time revival. And we've got to understand there's a harvest coming like the world has never seen. One of the recent prophecies that came within the last few months didn't come through me, but it said, there, there are no people on earth who have seen what will be seen in this revival. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> My goodness. People who are alive today have seen some mighty things through the hands of men like Oral Roberts and women like Amy Simple McPherson and, and many, Catherine Kuhlman and, you know, on and on and on. You could, you could go, A.A. A. Allen, on and on. The miracles that have been seen. But he said, the Holy Spirit said, there's no one alive today who have seen like the level or the degree of supernatural miracles that will be seen in this end time revival. It's going to be at one, one place. He said it's going to be even bigger than the book of Acts. Oh, my goodness. What are we about to see? This is going to be incredible. I am so blessed to be alive. What a time to be alive. I'm so blessed to be alive at this time. And, I'm, and like my mother says, I'm only 75, so I've got a long time to be here on the planet and getting healthier all the time and look, looking forward to what's coming. But now we're coming up to the recent messages about we have this treasure in earthen vessels. See, because what treasure is that? Well, that treasure is the word. It is true that when you got born again, God sowed the word into you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We have this treasure now, Christ in us, in earthen vessels. I mean, that's pretty easy for us to understand. Our bodies are from the earth. They're pretty much made out of clay and water. And, and this, they can be broken. They can be bruised. They can be killed. They're still mortal. How many know? Alan's been teaching recently about the glorified body that we're going to have one day. Boy, I'm looking forward to that one. <laughs> but in the meanwhile, uh, we're wearing this one. And we have to keep it mortified. That's part of the message, too. Got to keep it under, like Paul said. But there's a reason for that, too. We have to keep it under dominion. Why? So that Christ in us can have dominion. See, what God's trying to do now is manifest his son through his body how be it his body now is us <laughs> we are the body of christ i didn't look up those scriptures for you we've taught on it so many times you can look them up but we are the body of christ and members in particular in ephesians it says we are bone of his bone yeah i mean it doesn't get much more clear than that we are his eyes we are his hands and he lives through us. Uh, my, I have to follow, as he brings the images now, my job is to follow him. See, I'm seeing right now Ananias, who the Bible says, and I'm not the one who lied about the offering, <laughs> the other Ananias, that after, after Saul had his Damascus Road experience and was blinded 
and they led him by the hand to a certain place, God of Jesus appeared in a vision to a, it says a disciple named Ananias. And he wasn't part of the fivefold. We're not told he was an apostle or prophet or anything like that. He just said a disciple named Ananias. And Jesus appears to him and gives him simple instructions. Go to this place, go to this street, inquire at this house. You're going to find a man named Saul of Tarsus in there. He's had a vision of a man coming named Ananias <laughs> who's going to pray for him. And Ananias was a little bit scared at first when he realized who Jesus was talking about. Who? You said who? Saul of Tarsus? Do you know who that is? Do you know he arrests Christians and has them, some of them killed and some of them arrested? And are, you, are you sure, Lord? But the Lord assured him, yes, I know who you're talking about. Now you go and do what I told you. Now here's the thing. Ananias has got no, I mean, he's not a giant that we know of in the faith. He's, he's not called an, the apostle of apostles or an apostle at all. He's just a disciple. But he heard the Lord. He obeys the Lord. He does exactly what the Lord tells him. When he gets there, he, he announces himself. I'm, I'm hello, I'm, I'm Ananias. I, the Lord that appeared to you, he's appeared to me and told me what to do. And I've come here that, to pray for you that you receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, here's the part. Ananias has got a mortal, mortal hands, just like you and I have mortal hands. But when Ananias lays his hands on Saul and prays, the treasure goes to work. <laughs> the Holy Spirit flows. Ananias' hands, if you'll allow me, become the hands of Christ. Because Christ has no hands on planet Earth but ours. And all he needs are disciples, believers, don't have to be in the fivefold, who hear the Lord and obey the Lord. And when we do, our mortal bodies are his body, no less than when he had his own physical body on planet Earth. And you're going to see that in a, maybe a, a little different way today. But how simple was that? So we don't, we don't want to overcomplicate this. Ananias heard, heard. Now you got to spend time with the Lord. I know Anna. I'm sure Ananias would. You know, uh, I, I, we're not told hardly anything about him, and I think that's on purpose, so that we don't try and build him up to be something special. Ananias was a man, a disciple who loved the Lord, but he it does call him a disciple. Now that means he was a disciplined follower. I have no doubt in my mind that Ananias was a man of the Word, a man of prayer, a man of worship. I probably threw in some fasting. We're not told anything now. But he was a disciple. And Jesus said, in this dispensation, when the bridegroom has been taken away, he said, my disciples will fast. We've studied that several times. So we don't want to overcomplicate it. You hear what the Lord says? You do what the Lord says? See, then the Lord does what we can't do. Ananias on his own has no power to open the eyes of the blind. Paul was blind. Ananias doesn't have any innate power in his humanness. So when he, but when he heard from the Lord and did what the Lord said, he, like all of us, Ananias has this treasure in an earthen vessel that the power may be of God, God within, and not of us. So when Ananias obeyed the instructions that came from the mind of Christ by the vision that came by the Holy Ghost, the power just flowed. And that's the point. The power will flow when we are sold out to doing what the Lord tells us to do. Every time the Lord tells you something, that is your go to the other side moment. <laughs> Let us pass over to the other side. He gives you an instruction. Sue and I have received instructions down through these years how he wanted to do the ministry through us. And he, he's told us things to do that he hasn't told other ministers to do. And I tell, for example, he told us not to ever sell anything, and we never have. We, if you go to our website and hunt all you want, now you, there's a place where you can give a free will offering, but you'll never find anything for sale. Well, why, Gary, are you, are you convinced it's absolutely wrong for ministers to sell anything? 
I don't think it's wrong at all. I intended to sell the cassette tapes. <laughs> Before I heard him say, don't do it, that's, I went, oh, that's how he's going to do it. Every, you know, we're going to sell this and that and sell books and all this stuff. No, no, I'm not against any of that. I just know what he said to us. See? Doesn't, that's why I tell people all the time, don't try and imitate what we do except this one part. Pray until you learn to hear him. Then obey what he says to you. It doesn't do you any good to hear what he says to me. You go. He's got a. He's got a particular plan for your life. You go pray and learn to listen and hear him, and you will, because my sheep hear my voice. Take that as a great confirmation. You're one of his sheep, and you hear his voice. You'll get your instructions. <laughs> and yours will probably look impossible too. You know whatever it is he tells you to do. <laughs> well. Anyway, see, that's examples of sowing the word right there. That, To me, that instruction for us is just as valid as let us pass over to the other side. That is an instruction for Gary and Sue. And we're not ever going to violate that. And that's what he said. That's what we're going to do. There's some other things he told us. And there's really no point in sharing all of that. It's not about me. It's about you today because... You have the same treasure in your earthen vessel. And I'm telling you, in that treasure, all things are possible. And he may tell you some things sometimes that seems a little scary, like it scared Ananias, you know. <laughs> How important was it for Ananias to obey the Lord? You know, he didn't have to. He could have said no. <laughs> Just think. Saul of Tarsus wound up being the one who wrote at least half and maybe two-thirds of the New Testament. Not only that, he started off so many churches, so many people born again. Do you know part of that reward will always be on Ananias? Because the Lord used Ananias to help launch that ministry. Man, <laughs> I know Ananias forever will be eternally grateful that he received that assignment even though it scared him at the beginning. Don't let it scare you. And even if it does scare you, do it anyway. That's what courage is. Courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is doing it in the face of fear. Do it anyway. So, anyway, getting back to today's message. Now, after Jesus taught them, I don't have time to do any more review. We've got to get into the lesson now. Let's see. Yep, okay. The clock is so little on this thing, I have to look up there to see it. Okay. <laughs> the sower sows the word. After Jesus had taught, he taught it first publicly about the sower sows the word. The disciples didn't fully understand it, and they asked him to explain. And as you can read it in Mark 4. He did. He explained it in more detail. And he didn't even gave them some uh more material at the end of that, where he told them it's really all about maturity. Now, that... That seed that's sown on the inside of you has to grow up. It doesn't come into you full grown. When you get born again, you're, you know, you're not instantly the next second, oh, I'm fully mature in Christ. No. He said it's first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. Don't rush off the day after you got born again, try and win the world. You need time to let the seed grow. That new man on the inside of you is complete, just like a baby's complete. <laughs> One of the best illustrations of that is something that really happened when I was born. The doctor had a little fun with my earthly father, O.R. Carpenter. Of course, my dad was waiting and waiting, you know, to find out, uh, you know, did everything go okay? In those days, they didn't allow the husband in with the wife. I know he you youngins don't understand that, but we, no, no, that, that wasn't even an option. You waited in another room till the baby was born. But then they come in and told you. And so they told my dad, well, it's a boy. You, you've got a boy and, uh, and everything's, you know, the mother and child are doing okay. And, uh, but the, the doctor teased my dad a little bit and said, well, uh, there is one problem. Oh no, what, what is it? He doesn't have all of his toes on one, one foot. And at first you, oh. then the doctor smiled and went, no, half of his toes are on the other foot. <laughs> I hope my dad didn't hit him or anything. <laughs> See, what's, what was the message? Your baby is complete, sir. He's got the right amount of toes, the right amount of fingers. He's got two eyes, two ears, two, 
One knows. <laughs> the, your baby's complete. But he's certainly not mature. Going to take a long time. Going to take a lot of food. Going to take a lot of exercise. Going to take a lot of love and nurturing to take this child from being a baby to being a mature man. And that's exactly what Jesus said about the sower sows the word. Now, in the context of him sowing Christ in you, there is a new man on the inside of you that is made in righteousness and holiness after the image of Christ. And in that new man is the potential to grow up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, to grow up into maturity. But he doesn't come in full grown. He comes in complete. You are righteous, you are holy, you have the nature of God, but it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of food, meaning the Word of God, a lot of digestion of that food, meaning praying and praying in the Holy Ghost and let the Holy Ghost be your teacher. That new man's going to have to go to school, <laughs> the school of the Holy Ghost, the school of the Word of God. First the blade. You don't try and harvest when maturity is only at the blade level. Then the ear, we used to call those nubbins where I grew up, nubbins, you know, they're about little corn <laughs> shafts about that long, call them nubbins. You don't want to try and eat those, trust me, I've, I've tried them. <laughs> That's not harvest time either, just because the ears appear. No. There's a maturing process. you got to nurture that crop till it becomes the full corn in the ear. Let it mature. Then it's harvest time. God. And that's where he's bringing us into revival. He's been maturing us and maturing us and having us learn how to mortify the deeds of the body and growing us up in Christ. And hell has been throwing everything, including the kitchen sink at us. Things that we kind of expected and things we did not expect at all with the intent of getting us to quit. It, you know, just give us up. Just go be a nice, just shut up and go be a nice little Christian somewhere and stop contending for this revival. And we're not going to do it. We're going to continue. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. I know I'm coming into understandings of like even Mark chapter 4 and 5 that I've never had in all my Christian life. I've been around this a long time. And some of the things that he's bringing out now, I've never heard them before. But I'm hearing them now and seeing them now. And why is that? We're getting really close to harvest time. We're coming into this thing. Uh, I believe we're already in the edge waters of revival. I believe we're already splashing around in it. Reminds me a little bit of the, what Ezekiel saw, you know. First the waters were ankle deep. Then they were knee deep. <laughs> then they were hip deep. Then they became waters to swim in. See? And the Holy Spirit is like a river, not a lake. There's always a flow with the Holy Ghost. You walk that in. A river has a current. You can feel it flowing. When you step out into it, you can feel that pressure against your legs. You know, if you keep going deeper into it, you can feel it. Gets, you know, pretty soon you're out there so far, your little tippy toes are still touching the bottom. You're still in control. You can feel the flow of that current, though. It's a river. You take one more step where your toes aren't touching the bottom anymore. And you're going to lose control. And then the river is going to take you where it wants you to go. God, I'm preaching real good. I'm preaching real good. Boy, that's where the Holy Spirit's bringing us to. He's going to take us where Jesus wants us to go. And it's going to be a flow out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water this spake of the holy ghost that's flowing out it's more than tongues tongues is a method it's a it's to get us there but the flow is the power and the anointing of almighty god the blind see the lame walk the deaf hear and they get saved by the thousands Whew. what a time to be alive thank god what a time to be alive and i'm I just saw the news flash in front of me there. See, boy, you got to be careful not to not to dwell too much on it. We all have to have some of it to know how to pray. But don't dwell on the news. Don't let that be your source. I mean, dear Lord, it's depressing. 
you let you got to have if there's ever a time to feed on the word of god and to feed on like great messages like pastor dave's messages and I, I mean, I hear all of the messages that come through Bronk and through Pastor Jim and through Alan and, and uh, Hans. I don't miss any of them. I need them. God, God, see that brick wall behind me? Remember how Dave would talk about revelation knowledge is brick by brick by brick by brick, and you got to have all of them? You can't be having no gaping holes here and then eventually try and have a roof come down on that. No, it's got to be the salt. you got to have all of them. Let the Holy Spirit build in you, line upon line, precept upon precept. He's building these walls and getting ready to put some roof, roof answers on there for us. Okay, well, after he taught on the sower sows the word all day, then he demonstrates it near the end of the chapter. Because he, he does sow the word. He sows, Jesus sows the word into his disciples when he says, let us pass over to the other side. Now, they've got their assignment. The sower has sowed the word for them. Now, this is a great illustration of we have this treasure in earthen vessels. How do you demonstrate that before the cross and the resurrection? Well, they put the treasure in a wooden vessel. <laughs> they had him in a boat, which also can be broken, which can be bashed, which can be sunk, can be destroyed. They had the treasure in an earthen, in a wooden vessel, a ship, and they're taking him to the other side. It's a type and shadow, if you'll allow me, of us having him in our earthen vessel. But it's probably the best the Holy Spirit could do before the new birth is available. It's a picture of having Christ in a wooden vessel, and they're in there too. And we're going to the other side. We have received the word of God, and we are doing what, what he told us, and we're going to the other side. And sure enough, just like Jesus said, he said, Satan comes immediately to steal the word. And one of the things that he uses is the cares of this world. Remember that? That's in Mark 4. The cares of this world. Well, here comes this great storm. Well, what's the purpose? Fear. And it must have been quite a storm because many of these men were fishermen. They had made a living on that same sea their whole life. They had weathered many storms, no doubt, on that sea. Yet this one was so bad, no matter what they did, the ship was getting full of water and looked like it was going to sink to the point they thought they were going to die. And I noticed that when they finally went to Jesus to cast the care on him, <laughs> don't you care? <laughs> don't you care that we perish? You know, notice I, it finally dawned on my lightning quick mind one day that the storm had accomplished its purpose. See, those, every circumstance that comes against you when you set out to obey the word of God, they're designed for one purpose, and that's to get you to stop. Fear. And I noticed when they asked him, they did not, they, when they woke Jesus up, they did not say to him, Master, we're really having trouble getting to the other side. That was not on their mind at all. The storm had accomplished it per, its purpose. It's only about survival now. Don't you care that we perish? We're all going to die. We're going to die. We're going to die. And, you know, if you're not careful, you can fall into that same thing today. You know, look at all the things that's happened to the prayer center. You know, this has happened and that's happened, and now we don't even have a building. We're going to die. We're going to die. No, we're not. We're going into revival. I don't know what the end is going to look like. I just know what he said. I'm going to hang on to what he said because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I'm choosing to believe what God said. He said, go back and listen to those bl blueprints and the subsequent prophecies again. What does that tell you? He has not changed his mind. <laughs> he has not changed his mind. And we're going to have everything exactly just like he said we're going to have it. Now, that's the truth. That's what he said. Faith believes what he said. Anyway, so that storm accomplished in them. It got them. They're not even thinking about the mission anymore. They didn't say, we're having trouble getting to the other side. What they said was, don't you care that we're about to die? The storm worked, it got them diverted. The cares of this world, they're th only thinking about survival now. Dear Lord, I remember in the early days when Sue and I were obeying the instructions of the Lord and it looked like financial suicide to do it the way he told us to do it. And I'm not telling anybody else to do it that way. Uh, but what the way he told us to do it, it sure looked like financial suicide. And boy, did the storm come and the circumstances came and the fear I mean, it looked like we were going to be, 
I'm, I would I would wake up in a cold sweat. I'd be having dreams of Sue and I living under, becoming homeless and living under a bridge and wearing gunny sacks and and fear, man, just fear, trying to get us to disobey what he said. You know, to do something different. Thank God I've got a wife. I'm telling you. She told me, she said, I, if that's, if it really happens, if, if that's what happens, you and I wind up sleeping under a bridge and wearing gunny sacks, I'm still telling you, I want you to obey God. You obey God. I don't believe that'll happen, but even if it does, I still want you to obey God. And I got me a wife, I tell you, glory to God. <laughs> so anyway, thank God we held on to the word and so did the disciples and they got him to the other side. Now. We've taught this so many times. Now, here's where we're going to get into today's lesson. Now, listen to this. See, when they got Jesus to the other side, in that case, their assignment was finished. From that point, see, what happens when they get there, there's all, there's, see, they've obeyed the word, but there hasn't been any fruit yet. The fruit wasn't getting to the other side. The fruit was the madman of Gadara. And when they get there, they, they meet this madman of Gadara that was famous in that region. Nobody could even go past that way because, you know, he was naked in the tombs and they uh, moaning and cutting himself with stones. This guy was so devil possessed. You know, when the devils come out of him and went into the pigs, it said there was about 2,000 pigs. How many devils did this guy have? And scary. And they couldn't even bind him with chains. Now, it took some kind of supernatural strength, you know. I double checked to make sure it wasn't ropes. No. They couldn't bind this guy with chains. Man, somehow he'd break the chains. And here's what was the fruit? Why, why so the word, let us pass over to the other side? It was to get to the madman of Gadara. He's the fruit. See? Save the lost. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out devils. Raise the dead. There's your fruit. There's your fruit. Jesus, if you'll allow me, had left the safety of the ninety and nine on the other shore. And he had come to seek and to save this one that was lost. Boy, was this guy lost. He was beyond all human help. Even Jesus didn't try and counsel this guy. It says immediately he started commanding those devils to come out of him. This guy was beyond any 12-step program. I'm not against those. But he was, a, he was beyond self-help. He was beyond all human help. He had to have the supernatural power of the living Christ. And boy, here he come. And the point is, the disciples, now that they've gotten Jesus, if you'll allow me, just, okay, here we've landed the boat. We're going to stand over here on the side, as, as however many was in the boat. We're going to stand over here, and we're going to watch the treasure, Jesus, who was in the, we, he was in the wooden boat. We brought him to the other side. Now, we're going to stand here, and we're going to watch. And Jesus does all the work. He's the one that speaks. He's the one with authority. He commands those devils to come out of him. Uh, you, you know the story. In the end result, the man is sitting there clothed and in his right mind. And as if, the, as if that's not enough, at the, later when Jesus is about to leave and the man wants to go with him, well, wouldn't you too? <laughs> Jesus says, no, I have an assignment for you. And he sows, he sows this guy into the nation there. He says, no, I need you to go into this whole area, which that area was called Decapolis because there was 10 cities there. This guy's famous. Everybody knows him. I want you to go and tell what great things the Lord has done for you. Can you imagine? Everybody knew who this guy was. Everybody knew who he was. And now they see him clothed in his right mind. How did that happen? And all he's doing is giving his testimony. The Bible doesn't really call him an evangelist. It says, no, I want you to go and tell. Well, we can all go and tell what great things the Lord has done for us. And what he's doing, I mean, when the people see this guy, if, if Jesus has the power to save this guy and to set this guy in his right mind, maybe Jesus is who he says he is. <laughs> It's, he's preparing the ground for the day when they'll, when Jesus may come back to that region, and they can they can be harvested for the kingdom of God. Everything Jesus does is about glorifying the Father. Father, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. 
Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. Amen. Jesus, his whole life was surrendered completely to the Father. Our whole life is to be surrendered completely to Jesus. And as that process happens, the Father will be glorified in the Son who is in us. Boy, I'm preaching real good right now. That's, that's really good stuff. I like it myself. Oh, man. I feel, I feel the little goosebumps there. <laughs> All right. Now, you've got the picture of the disciples. Once they get Jesus to the other side, picture my hand. Here's, here's the disciples, okay? They're going to stand over on the side, and they're going to watch the treasure now go to work. So they're watching. They don't say nothing. Jesus doesn't have them lay hands on, speak, nothing. They are just watching. Their, their work is finished. They're watching him work. Now, here's the lesson for today. What's different now? Now, for today's lesson, it's just you and Jesus in the boat. But really, <laughs> okay, let's start right there. It's you and Jesus in the boat. And you get an assignment. Let's cross over to the other side. You get past the storm. But it's not really a boat. See, Christ is in you now. So you hear him tell you, let's cross over to the other side. All right, so you get to the other side. Let's say you come, you come across a demon-possessed person. It's modern times. Christ is in you. You've, come, you've obeyed him. You've come to this place. And there's that a demon-possessed guy, just as demon-possessed as the madman of Gadara. And Jesus wants to do the same work. Can you go stand on the side and not say anything? See, it says immediately Jesus began commanding those devils to come out of him. How's he going to do that today? The treasure is in your earthen vessel now. How is the treasure going to command those devils to come out? The only vocal cords he has are yours. If you're not allowing him to speak, if you're not willing to speak in his name, he doesn't get to speak. He doesn't have authority here unless you allow him to speak through your lips. That's the reason he had to leave us in these earthen vessels. To live on this planet, you've got to have a body from this planet. Try living here without one. It won't, it won't happen. You know, even the, uh, you know, even the, even the founder of Walmart did not get to run the board meetings after he left the planet. <laughs> he lost his authority. <laughs> and his descendants or whoever had to take over, you know. You have authority here while you've got a body here. Jesus has a body here, all right, but it's our body. Now, this is where we've got to grow up to because this revival has got to come through us just like it came through Ananias. We have to learn to hear the Lord. And when he says, speak in my name, well, first off, when he says, let us pass over to the other side, we got to pass over to the other side. Now, that doesn't always mean get in a boat, boat and go across the lake. That's any instruction you get from God. See, to me, our, one of our instructions, don't ever sell anything that I give you. Don't ever sell it. Make everything free. To me, that is a pass over to the other side instruction. My job is to always obey that. Okay? And I'm not, it's not optional for me. That's if I'm gonna if I'm gonna be a disciple, then I'm gonna do that because that's what he said to me. I say, well, Gary, I don't believe he said that to you. Well, I don't care what you believe. To be honest with you, <laughs> well, I kind of care a little bit, but it's not gonna change me. Thank God for Pastor Dave who taught us how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And if you haven't heard those lessons or haven't practiced those lessons, go back. I believe it, I believe he calls it distinguishing God's voice. And it's, that's just two, it's just two messages. I practiced what's on those messages for months, and I mean literally months, before I was able to distinguish his voice. But not everybody does it the same way. Other people seem like they can hear it different, you know. But I do know this. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Whew. Could teach a lot right there, but I can't get diverted. Dave's already... Mwah. Every message by Dave Roberson at his website is a Rembrandt, a Picasso, a 
detailed step-by-step -step instruction on how to hear the voice of God. And it's not just those two messages. Many of those messages uh, will, will teach you. I'll tell you this much. God's not withholding his voice from you. He's not like that. He's not withholding his voice. He's not, he's not holding back the good stuff from you. We are very much like radios. I see an old, old-fashioned radio like I grew up with that had a dial and, you know, a little boxy radio thing that we had before transistors and all. And radio waves were constantly going through the, the house all the time. But you could have a perfectly good radio and just have it turned off. And it's not, you're not hearing what's going on the radio. Well, it must not be broadcasting. Well, sure, they're broadcasting. You got the radio turned off. <laughs> the analogy, you're not listening. You're not getting quiet. You're not, you know, you could have the radio on and have a lawnmower and a hair blower and five, four other things going at the same time, and you still wouldn't be able to hear it. You Sometimes you got to get quiet, spend some time, maybe even in fasting, get quiet. Be still and know that I'm God, you know. And, and uh, so you might have the radio off. Sometimes you might have the radio turned to the wrong frequency or you're getting a static. <laughs> well, now that's where Dave's, that's kind of where I was. I was listening. Man, I'd listen like crazy. And I, I would say the, the silence is deafening, you know. <laughs> well, the problem was it wasn't that I wasn't listening. I didn't know how to dial in. You know, and it's that way with a radio. It's perfectly good radio, but if you're in between stations, you're not getting anything but static, and that's kind of the way it was with me. Well, those those two messages on distinguishing God's voice. Oh, well, one day I dialed, I got the dial, and I hit it right, and man, I be, I began to hear. Now, here's the thing: God had been talking to me all the time. I have no doubt of that whatsoever. It was not a matter of him waiting and waiting and waiting until Gary suddenly is able to hear. No. I am his son. He is my father. He is withholding no good thing from me. He was talking all the time. I was just hearing the static because I didn't know where in me God speaks. And that's the benefit of those two messages. Dave said it again and again. It's, it's very similar to the conscience. No, your conscience is different than your thoughts. <laughs> you can be thinking one thing and your conscience really bothering you at the same time. Well, where your conscience speaks on the inside of you, this is identically the same place where the Holy Spirit speaks. And now I'm going to pick on Gary again because Gary in the early days, and, and longer than just the earliest days, I uh, was in the habit of violating my conscience a lot. But that also makes it hard to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not listening right there. I don't want to hear that. But that's where the Holy Spirit speaks. Yeah, but that's my conscience. I don't want to obey that. But, but I'm not listening to that. But that's where the Holy Spirit speaks. Yeah, but I don't. Can you see the issue? <laughs> so and sometimes it's obedience. You got to start obeying him in the little things. And uh, it'll make that place in you. Uh, tender. Trust me, I know what it is to harden your conscience. I have done that more than once in areas. And trust me also when I say First John one nine, if you get, if you really mean it, and you go and you confess your sins and really mean it, He will not only forgive you. It says He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And what I have learned from that is, He'll He'll help make that place that conscience in you tender again, where you can hear Him again. Now don't start disobeying it or you're going to put a callus on it again and make it hard to hear. Boy, I'm kind of getting off track again. Now, getting back to today's lesson. We, we don't get to stand over on the side like the disciples and watch external of us while Jesus does all the work where he speaks and he commands and does all that. No, we are one now. We are, we are one. Christ in us. That's pretty good. Christ in us. He has no vocal cords but yours and mine. When he says speak, we have to speak or he doesn't get to. 
again, it goes, I see Ananias again. If Ananias had not been willing to physically go, put himself in danger, really, speak what the Lord had said to him, and then lay hands and whatever exactly all he did, but the power of the Holy Spirit flowed through his body no less than it would flow through Jesus when he was here himself. And the scales fell off of Saul's eyes and he could see. Well, you said, well, Ananias really did something. Ananias did not make Saul see. Just like Jesus said, it's not me doing the works. It's the Father in me doing the works. Well, Ananias would have said, that's the power of the Holy Ghost you're seeing there. I didn't make the man see. I just obeyed what the Lord told me. There it is. It doesn't get any more simple than that. He, so, he tells us. He sows the word. Let us pass over to the other side. Give everything away free. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. I want, it could be a, a million things. But it's your things. <laughs> it's what he said to you. And it becomes your cross over to the other side instruction. And as you obey him, your body is no less his body. It's no less his body than when he was on planet Earth himself. I've, I've so meditated that event where Ananias comes in. Just little disciple. Not five-folder. Just little disciple, Ananias, who was afraid. But he comes anyway, because that's what courage is. Brother Saul starts right off. Brother Saul. <laughs> Don't kill me. <laughs> Brother Saul. <laughs> Jesus had appeared to you in the way, and you, you, you can read it. But when he obeys his cross over to the other side instructions, the point of it is he had the treasure in his earthen vessel, and the power that flowed was of God and not of Ananias. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the power may be of God and not of us. Even if we're afraid, even if it's scary, let us pass over to the other side. Learn to hear his voice. Do what he tells you, even if it's scary. We're coming into revival. We're coming into the greatest revival the world has ever seen. What a time to be alive. And a minimum of a billion people are going to be swept into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Well, I didn't preach myself happy. I hope, I hope it's blessed you. It's certainly blessed me. Love you so much. See you again soon. Bye-bye for now.